The Easy Chain by Evan Dara, copyright 2008, published by Aurora Inc., New York and Roma. This is a nonprofit audiobook. Hello. That's the persnickety part, he once said. Farewell is paradise in comparison. He likes to cite Colbert. The principal problem is how we meet. And he says it in a way that you can really hear those capital letters. Actually, what he says is, but that's Lincoln's gift right there. Super luminous in a way. He takes you in a shake, and at the first trespassing of the fingertips, you're instantaneous old friends. What a monster. I mean, you remember that time at Aaron's when he brought Angie Tesler back from all those breakup tears? Or like, or when, at the KGB reception, when Carl Kitherson started telling him about how he got his partner to buy him out of their Porsche dealership three weeks before its front doors got splat with the eviction notice? Or when he... Or when that guy... I like to dwell on the evening when Lincoln put in an appearance at the reception Hildy Watterson gave for Peter Hurler. Over at Wish You Would in Hyde Park, of course the room downstairs. The 100 was pretty much all there, summer in splendor, open bar, plus Bollinger circulating on glove sprung trays. Some folks curled on the couches, but mostly it was the biz and the buzz on the floor chickly. The light purple and flickery, some girl with sprigs straggled in her extension. It was Peter's 26th, and Hildy decided to go thematic. She asked everyone to show dressed, or bearing, or making some kind of allusion to, you know, Hildy, 1975, year of our Peter's birth. No presents, if you please, but still. Caesar Stalling sailed in as Barry Lyndon, Sharon Neilds did Squeaky From, Red Bandana and all, and Thornton Davis found a miracle, miracle mint pair of earth shoes. And that Rand guy, Rand something or other, the one who took Cynthia Mills to Belize, oh, did he make a dashing Pol Pot. In the ears, acres of early Ronstadt. You're no good, when will I be loved, heat wave, but also sideshows of shining star and wildfire and fame. You know, when it was breathing. And so, you know, by nine-ish, things were heading toward liftoff. I personally saw four cell number swaps. Waiters were swabbing a second slop to drink, and the DJ had definitely slid a toggle from five to six. It was happening, and Peter, by then, Peter had become a test pad at a lipstick counter. Such a perfect image for Peter, around his smile a spectrum. At one point, some girl in swingy pearls was singing an old torch song to Peter, curling around, looking unto, intoning well, mend your heart and mind your soul. And Peter was already administering a hug when I happened to see a hollow forming in the center of the dance floor. Nothing dramatic, just people gently deferring, a dark spot spilling, the shades shifting. And then Lincoln, newly arrived at probably his third reception of the night, third, fifth, stepped into this hollow in three-piece Brooks Brothers Ecrubage. In fact, I didn't recognize him until I saw his hands, as he was wearing what I soon realized was a mask. A full around-the-head mask made from a disco ball, kissed a whole sparkly sphere brought down from 70s heaven, and lodged atop his shoulders. And there it, or he, was a glitter spray in the night sky, descended among us. Light moths flitted the room, alighting on clothes, on faces, on vertical surfaces. Granted, this was a rare surrender of Lincoln's native subtlety. Got up like the replacement's geodesic sibling, and you've got to assume Aaron came up with that idea. But folks laughed and loved it. Peter, smiling big, made a show of putting on dark glasses before hugging. Ran Hussis, gagged by approaching Lincoln with a martini glass, making to pour it through one of the boy's eye holes, then swigging the thing himself. And eventually Lincoln moved off the floor. But as he did, more Lincolnic fun. From my point of view, and presumably from others, the reflections plinking from Lincoln's sphere, from its full round ripply facets, made people's eyes, the eyes of the people looking at him, or even caught in refraction, grow brightly. But red. Apple shine red. Like in a bad photograph, before all that's photoshopped out. And it was sweet, you know? Seeing it all over the room, this reflected forest of glowing coals, 
Some folks noticed and turned away. Some folks noticed and didn't. I just thought it was smoking. You know, Lincoln is a customer of mine. Yes, he is. A steady customer of Russell's, located right here on Armitage Avenue, and has been for months, all through the moves, apartment after apartment. He calls on me to provide the flowers. When he was on Woodlawn Avenue, then over on Huron, and now at the penthouse on North State, I've been there with him all the way. That's right. He says he appreciates my quality. He says that all the time. And the guy's got taste, I'll tell you that. Not just peonies and roses for this fellow. He wants to make the house warm. He has me bring in ground sill for the living room display and hollyhock centerpieces, one for each table. And then ornaments of hyacinth. Hyacinth ornaments. Good taste. Old world taste. That boy is bred better than, well, as well as the boons we bring in. And he always tips the delivery guys, without fail. My men look forward to going, yes they do. And every Friday, when the guys make that week's delivery, Lincoln always asks for the prior flowers to be dropped off at an old age home. It's an extra effort, but we do it. Leave them in good shape for the old folks. How can I resist? Mr. Selwyn says my flowers deserve a proper retirement too. He once said, okay, when I asked him, that I could use his name for publicity. You know, just mention it when it might do some good. And it worked, I'll tell you that. It's how I came to provide the same service for Peter Hurler. It's really made me Chicago's premier place for flowers, no question. Russell's, right here on Armitage. The place in Chicago, that's right. There's elegance there, that's for sure. What you might call... He's attuned. He pays attention. He has, like, this really pronounced sense of what Bergeson called presentational space. That boy knows his manners. And all the restaurants and the clubs and... He's our Zagat guy. It's like, he instinctively understands some law of participation. Might his acceptance here, I mean, might it. Hell, I can just forget the PC business, which we all know means pure crap. I mean, the guy's European, Northern European, and I mean, Chicago. I mean, yeah, Jordan, and yeah, Jesse, and yeah, Oprah. But before them, before all that, it was Fermi in 42, opening up the Atom. It was Hef in 53, opening up editorial content. It was Ray and the K in 55, opening up the first McDonald's franchise in Des Plaines. Those guys opened everything up. Big steps? No longer cesspool of the world, or stormy, husky brawling, goodbye gutter snipe of cities. I mean, somebody said it's only in Hollywood that people strive to be second. Unexpectedly, unanticipatably. In some small sense, we have witnessed irretrieval. Lincoln lets those who meet him revisit some strand of experience. Some echo of experience we all know, still rumbling in the marrow, immigrant experience. Unexpected, via Lincoln Selwyn, from big shoulders to handsome hands, relight the white city, the city of man. We're number one. Number one. Number. From Porkopolis to Tapanadia. And it just reminds you that, like, Everything everyone says about Chicago is skonkic to the extreme. More hot air for the Windy City. Yes, there is elegance there. He's a product of a very fine family. He's from Holland. His parents are Dutch. His parents are British, though he grew up in the Netherlands. His father, he once let on, was descended from a run of Suffolk crofters. Good East Anglicans clustered near Whittington and Lavenham, who paid their taxes, poked fun at the pretense, took moral pride in pinching footwear, and made Sunday excursions to the lost cities of Dunwich and Thorpness, all but gone under centuries of North Sea surge. The father, Robinson, he said, was good at a local game called Wing Bill, which sent leather-covered handballs through striped stakes. Eventually, though, Robinson showed abilities in engineering, and went on to attend Cambridge as a Hay Scholar, Pembroke College, I believe. By that time, Robinson had grown to become an abundantly chipper young man, known for his quick smile and ready praise. After spending a summer break in Canada, at Banff, where he put to rest an interest in playing the viola, though his performance of the Walton Concerto did send bows rapping upon score parts, Robinson returned to Cambridge and achieved the breakthrough that let him push past Bentley's work to make significant advances in the field of tensile displacement, in particular, Cavanian lateralizations across contiguous masses. 
This led, soon after graduation, to a job with Cantor in Portsmouth, and eventually to his offer from Shell, at what he once described, through downheld eyes, as an irresistible salary, which brought the family to Den Helder, in the Netherlands. At Shell, he worked, primarily, designing subaquatic support structures for rigs. Lincoln's mom, Sarah, was just a bit older and a bit more well-to-do, he told me. She was from St. Ives and came from a close-knit family of crickle bats, which Lincoln said was local slang for people who live off rents. Sarah studied French and pedagogy at Cambridge. She wanted to be a teacher, but spent her afternoons in quilt making and got quite good. Her specialty was intricately imbricated things, inspired by Herman Dean's work with stitches and textures intertwining to form abstract but expressive patterns. She used to give her quilts to a nearby hospital. At first, the hospital used the quilts to warm patients, but then staff members started hanging them on day room walls because they were so good. Helped heal more people that way, one chief resident said. It was at Cambridge that Robinson and Sarah met, where, as Lincoln says, they were not introduced by friends. It was April 1962. One evening, Robinson was enlisted to accompany a friend to Carr's pub, where, niggle niggle, the friend had been set up on a blind date. Now, these were timidish, just pre-Beatles country people, so when a blind date happened, the set-up parties needed moral support. Support just to get in the door and, while we're at it, to provide backup if the whole thing came down in a heap. So Robinson toddled his friend into the pub, plied him with one, and, the yellow dress sighted, prodded him forth. Then, as per agreement, Robinson turned around and sat at the bar, and there he stayed, hoping that he wouldn't receive a tap on the shoulder in too few minutes. After about a quarter of an hour, a quarter of an hour of grizzling impatience, Robinson couldn't resist the pivot. So he began, slowly, slowly, to turn back. And while doing this, he saw right next to him a fair-haired girl in a position like his sitting at the bar and facing resolutely away from the pub center. As it turned out, this girl was also accompanying a friend who was on a blind date. And it was not the same blind date as Robinson's friends. And this was Sarah. All this came out in short order. They laughed like crazy. They called it the blind leading the blind. But Lincoln, Lincoln, he called it a double blind experiment. Only way to get reliable results, he said. Always quick with a comeback. He has a certain confidence, you see, an unmissable assurance. Yes, our young man is richly endowed with amour propre. The guy knows what he's doing. I always felt he's so confident because he doesn't own stocks. He told me he's in derivatives. Listen, this isn't entirely a joke. He showed up precisely at the same time as everyone else was getting nod stocked down. He arrived just after the 90s had reached some kind of conclusion that marks the end of all good comedies. One both surprising and inevitable. He's immune to the gloom, and that goes down just fine. We all thought we were different, that we would outwit the comeuppance, and he did. Ah, yes. What are the saddest words on Wall Street? It's different this time. There is touchiness here. All the IT businesses were not at all it anymore. They were the future that had become the past, blundering and burning left and right. Rows of boutiques along West Ontario were closing, and four sale signs were fluttering like flags of surrender up and down North Halstead. People weren't quite so interested in what region of Thailand their dinner came from. It was... It was like Wall Street was going to bomb us back to the industrial age. Rust thou wear it, and unto rust shalt thou re... Man, that sucked. That really fucking sucked. Arthur Anderson and all that shit. Kenny Boy and all that mofo... And now there's China. And now they say India. And so, you're like, expected to work way overtime. Because if you don't, if you don't, and don't think you're gonna get paid for it either. And like, health insurance? Man, it's forward into the past. Charlie Dickens, where are you? And now Lincoln, he, you know, he just haven't felt it since. It's like the boom years, the pinnacle years. Those really pinnacle times in, in the mid, late 90s. Remember them days? Listen, Lincoln got here just a few months before Florida before the miracle of our system, our great system of Texan, delivered the Dade County Coop. At a difficult juncture, lawfulness prevailed, venerable democracy won out, and a perversion of justice in electoral politics, where the best man, certainly the best man, 
held out as an antidote to moral weakness the promise of upstanding plutocracy. Yes, I was glad to see this good and bold and down-to-earth, this optimistic, really upright guy become a puppet president dancing upon purse strings, who'd finally, finally bring about fiscal discipline. Yes, this good man of deep Christian conviction, of humility, of moderation, of accountability, went ahead and baptized his entire nation, generation after generation, in red ink. It was rewarding. It was reassuring. In what other country could such hotly contested circumstances be resolved through a peaceful and orderly process? Whose outcome was presented from the get-go by the GOP as a fait accompli? That was their strategy. From the second the dispute arose, they made it seem as if the matter had already been resolved, that the outcome was determined, inevitable, that it was already over, a process that reached all the way to the Supreme Court. And then, when they made their ruling, when the Supreme Court deliberated and decided and sealed their truth forever, it was a beautiful moment. And it was true what they said. Every vote counted. <laughs> yep, you know, don't feel that way. Lincoln didn't pay much mind to all the election stuff. It's not that he didn't care. Well, maybe he didn't. When his family moved to Holland, he told me, he never listened to a word about politics and would always stay home on Queen's Day. He didn't want to participate in the parades and floats and everywhere sales. He never fully landed in his new Dutch homeland, he once said. His parents continued to speak English, it accounted for every word around the house, and he was sent to English language elementary and secondary schools. In fact, he used to say that the BBC was his home, and that suited him just fine. He wasn't unhappy there, he said, but his time was marked by alternating streaks of stubbornness and drift. After a few weeks in a Salter Dish hotel, the three Selwyns moved into a quite large, for Amsterdam, two-bedroom apartment spread over three floors at Lauriergracht 37. A tree-lined canal, easy walk to the Leitze plain, not so easy walk to the central station, but comfy and expansive, generously chosen by Shell for an appreciated employee. On a first floor porch overlooking the roughly rear yard, the family would sit and sip cups of oolong tea or play the hands of Ganasta. Of that could keep them engaged for hours. Because he didn't speak Dutch, well, no more than the inescapables like Prima and Janlul and Kut, and wonders like Var, which means both where and true, Lincoln didn't tune into Netherlands radio and TV. In fact, he said he developed a mistrust for Dutch media. They seemed to be speaking more than one language that was not his. So he would divert himself playing taggers and football in the Amstelveld, or visiting the unadvertised, not quite zoo, toward the rear of Vondelpark, an unkempt ratty grass, fenced in enclave, where an odd arc of animals, roosters, bisons, even llamas, would be deposited for a few weeks, then silently withdrawn. He would just have given a cult a name, he said, and come to recognize its markings, when the grazer would not be there anymore. By his first December in Amsterdam, Lincoln had learned to skate, and it quickly became his soul's sparkler. As many as four afternoons a week, he would make his way to a cavernous rink in a converted Municipal pool building, a quick step from the museum plane, where he would lace up his ankle mobilizing Bali patterners and start to oval, usually to piped in Lehar waltzes. He would continue until 18 minutes before his family's 6 30 dinner, milking every moment, adoring the overdriving, hell bent forward mobility that came from reducing his resistance to one narrowest line of contact. And the benefits the whistling air chilling the middle of his lips, the intense timelessness. The fine spray of snow as he rounded turns or changed gears. But his greatest fun in Holland, he said, was the Elfsteden Tocht, a midwinter ice skating marathon that ran for over 200 kilometers up north in Friesland. Starting in Leeuwarden, the course cut through frozen canals and rivers and lakes, past hundreds of thousands of vapor seeping spectators in Sneek and Stavoren and Hindelupen and Dokum and other freezing villages, before looping back to the Leeuwarden. It was, he said, stunning fun. Lincoln and his folks, bundled in down and woolen hats and unending grins, would pack into their car and run about from town to town, catching blurry glimpses. Maybe 17,000 bladers would slip by, everyone skittering into checkpoints to have pass cards stamped in each town and by hand. And along the way, brass bands and thousand voice sing-alongs and frostbite doctors ready to treat fingers and worse, tested 
by the unrelenting 20 below. The strongest skaters clocked in at around 7 or 8 hours, but the event didn't offer much of a prize beyond finding your correct shoes along the mountain of 34,000 at finish. And many people did it just to do it, not in competition. It had always been like that. The race had its origins, Lincoln learned, in a centuries-old local tradition of the journey. It began to be codified in the 1890s, and the first official El Sedentokt was run in 1909, in a contest won by the daughter of the country's largest manufacturer of skates. Thrillingly, the race took place during the first few Februarys that Lincoln spent in the Netherlands. Hail Van Bentham, victory eternal. And then it stopped. The race disappeared. The reward of the winter was gone. There were no trips up north. The rumble car stayed in its slot. The regional council said the ice wasn't thick enough. Someone had determined that, for safety reasons, the course had to maintain a minimum thickness of 15 centimeters throughout. And for year after year, it just didn't. Some folks tried filling the holes in the ice. Others even performed what they called ice transplants. And while a region full of people waited week after week for good news, winter after winter, Lincoln worked on his own skating at an indoor rink in Amsterdam. Lincoln says the Dutch are not the people who complain. You know, I mean, Lincoln. He says he likes, he really appreciates something about the Dutch. You know, he speaks freely about this stuff, uh, about his background. It's like nostalgic. It's like he's living it all over again for the first time. And one thing he says he likes is Dutch directness. This, like, no beating around the mulberry bush quality they have. Like, he says when he wanted to ask a girl out, like when he'd met someone on a grocery line or at a bar or something, and he'd ask her out, he'd smooth up with the usual gloop about a drink or a record or a movie. He'd, like, gulp and sweat and work up the nerve to launch the, the question. And the girl would just go, no. And that's it. He says they tell you off just like that. One fucking or non-fucking word. No nicety sauce about, well, I'd like to, but, or, thanks for asking, but, or, I got a boyfriend. Just straight out, take a walk. And Lincoln, I mean, he says he loved that. He says in Holland, he preferred the rejections to the acceptances. He had friends in Amsterdam, sure he did. His best buddy, he says, was a kid named Klaus, who lived around the corner, around the canal corner, with his folks. Klaus had toe hair and liked to punch, but he spoke English. His father did international sales. And they spent most of their time playing football or looking at Klaus's magazines about American hot rods. Klaus loved American hot rods. He had posters all up and down his bedroom walls. Lincoln and Klaus occasionally went to concerts at the Bandschel in Vondelt Park on Sunday afternoons. But one day, Klaus showed up with a pair of tickets to a football game. We're talking Dutch football here. You know, soccer. The tickets had come from a friend of Klaus's father, Lincoln said, but that Sunday, neither the Klaus friend nor the Klaus friend's father could go, so Klaus biked Lincoln. They're about 13 or 14 now, out to De Meer Stadium, and they got pretty good seats. One third of the way up, about midfield. It was a blustery day. It's November, and crowded, and the game was pretty intense. Feyenoord, a team from Rotterdam, was playing Ajax, the crew from Amsterdam Oost. Well, you can imagine. Cheers and razzes and jump ups and beer spills all over the place. So Lincoln's sitting there watching the game, he said, chomping on some crunchy fried cheese cylinder thing he'd copped from the local purveyor of crunchy fried cheese cylinder things. Apparently, there's a lot of them there in Holland. And people were getting into the game, hollering and such, and talking and all jumping around. And then, just into the second half, Lincoln notices something he hadn't noticed before, that he's like, hissing when one team's got the ball. And he realized, he said, that he'd been doing it since about halfway through the first period. When Ajax had possession, he would hiss at them. And then, he realized, he wasn't the only one, but practically everybody in the stands would start to give off a gassy hiss the second Ajax got the ball. Well, it was funny as hell. Everybody just doing this thing quickly, automatically, every time the players were running one way. It became a kind of stadium-wide joke a listening goof, and he looked forward to it coming around again. And it did, every time. Finally, a few minutes into the second period, he said, during a field and globing hiss that kept up the steam during a 60 meter rush, Lincoln hit the limits of his lung capacity. So he dropped out, and as Klaus was leaning into his escaping sound, Lincoln poked him in the shoulder through a blue parka. 
Klaus turned and smiled, and Lincoln finally asked him what the hell's going on. And Klaus, after finishing the 60 meter hiss, and then a last few chews of the Three Musketeers, he leaned over and told Lincoln that the Ajax team was owned by a Jew. Then Klaus smiled. Well, of course Lincoln thought about this, and then asked what that had to do with anything. Klaus smiled again. A little souvenir of Buchenwald, he said. Lincoln looked at him all scrunched. Familiar sound there, man. And Klaus smiled again, Lincoln said, and turned back to the game. The score is so close. So this, like, now whoa. Lincoln winced, he said, and turned away from the action. It was like, what? And what could? And how could? And how did? And what kind of people? And he wondered, could this be a part of Dutch directness? Part of what he liked about them? Lincoln was not Jewish, C O V all the way, but what the? It seemed to come so easily to them, he said. He spoke about this freely. They did it so casually, without a single back hiss of objection. In their Dutch direct way, they made this monstrousness seem altogether natural. So Lincoln would be direct as well. He turned to Klaus. Hey, how can they do that? Klaus, come on, this is fun. Lincoln stared at him. Klaus, come on, man. I mean, what do you want? It's what they think, and it's the only time they get to let it out. To do what they want to, what they really mean. Well, it was an answer, and a direct one. But Lincoln was peeved. He had asked about they. When Lincoln finally turned back to the field, it was an entirely different game. Same players, same goals, different game. So, when Ajax next acquired possession, and the release of sibilance followed, each time, as if a switch had flicked, Lincoln started hissing as well. But now, he said, he was hissing them, and using their hiss for cover. He did this for a while, he said, as strongly as he could, even lifting from his chair as he added thoracic passion to his protest. And he wondered if anyone understood that now they were the targets of the foul sound. But soon he stopped. He made himself stop, he said, because no one was turning around. No one had realized that they were now the object of violence. And eventually, he understood that all he was doing was adding volume to the general hiss itself. As for the rest of the game, well, Lincoln said the last 30 minutes were longer than the others. The problem then became, Lincoln said, how to get home. The stadium was far from the centrum, and Klaus had the bicycle, and Lincoln did not want to get on that thing with him. Revolted, he said, repelled by the guy. But darkness was falling, and as Lincoln and Klaus walked across the parking lot to the perimeter fence where the bike had been chained, Lincoln raked the crowd to find a familiar face from school, from anywhere, that might give him a ride, or for someone whose parents might be there with a the car. But there was no one, among all the thousands, and it was getting cold, and it was just too long to walk. He'd never be back for his Sunday supper, a thing for his father. Besides, he said, he didn't want to speak to any of them in his, in their, broken Dutch. He got on the bike. He was dropped at home. He didn't say a word on the way back, not a thing about a thing. When he got home and went inside his room, he took off one canvas shoe, the right, and kicked, sharply, twice, the sharp corner of the wooden base of his captain's bed. He sat down and, while the ball of his foot and two middle toes throbbed and screamed, he took off his coat, then took off the other shoe. Then he pulled his left foot back and Lincoln continued to see Klaus in their shared neighborhood, but after he did not return a second of Klaus's phone calls, things went slack. Klaus never spent himself to ask the question. Lincoln knew gratitude for not having to provide the reply. He took to avoiding Klaus's street, and just nodded his head when the strategy met its inevitable shortcomings. So did things continue between them until Lincoln left for university, in Groningen, in the gold-green north of the country. By then, Lincoln wanted a bit of distance from Amsterdam, and Groningen's English-language Embry College, which had an affiliation with Reed in Oregon, seemed both far enough and close. He had also begun to read by then, coming to view books as passports, to Foucault, for his historicist theory for reducing action to reaction, to Schenkel, for his need for the proximity of paradise. He also sampled some American work. Lincoln said that, at college, he wanted to study personal negative epistemology, his own ignorance. He was yet to decide upon a major. But after one year in school and three weeks of a second, Lincoln was back in Amsterdam. Just up and quit, he said. Didn't even hang long enough to see about refunds. Made his folks do that, neither of which they liked. And you know, like, one time he said it had to do with a chick, 
and like other times it had to do with like some teacher or some such who got up his craw. Wasn't too clear, but he wanted to go back. He returned to a fine moment for the household and for his parents, he said. Shell continued to show its appreciation for Robinson's gifts, with regular raises and pairs of tickets to the Corre Theater for his shows and spectacles. When a promotion to R&D 2 that Robinson had in his unobserved moments thought he might warrant did not materialize, well, the man was blessed with enough native jolliness to keep things in perspective. All his other rewards were surely enough, and Lincoln's mother had, for the first time, accepted an offer of employment. Decidedly, there is no economic necessity. One day at breakfast, while sitting down to her red fruit muesli and coffee, she said that she'd like to spend a few days per week being more productive. She did not feel that she was contributing all that she might. In short order, she took a position at the Krasnopolsky Hotel as manager of client relations. She enjoyed having to put on and purchase her fine dresses, and it was an easy walk from home. Occasionally, the high responsibilities of the position entailed overtime. Indeed, for the family, it was a lovely moment. Back in Amsterdam, Lincoln started in on odd jobs. Cleaning this, moving that, you know the deal. Working at a place that rented out rebuilt bicycles, boat painting, whatever came up. Went on for a few years. Lincoln said it was good for him to see that side a little. The skater, he said, had turned to treading water. When Lincoln returned from Groningen, another skeet spun up. He began to spend days, then weekends, then more, in Ruigord, an entirely squatted village half hour by thumb, 20 minutes by bus 82 from Amsterdam. Without much prodding, the original invocation of Ruigord, its wood frame homes and steepled church, shaded tree lines and summertime hammocks, had emerged in the windy midst of a century-old polder. By the 1950s, it had grown into a community of 600 souls. But starting the expansion in the 60s, the village faced termination by the Amsterdam Port Authority. The world's largest port, Rotterdam, was 15 kilometers away. But Amsterdam wanted a port of its own, and so floated the idea of flooding Ruigord to get it. First to flow in was outrage and disputation. And three decades later, the idea was corked. But in the meantime, new, wide highways shoved the town like squeegees, and adjacent lands turned to sand. During the Thirty Years' Standoff, the inevitable happened. Residents decamped. Houses were hacked down. Limbo was loosed. Eventually, in 1973, Ruri Gord was abandoned by the few remaining holdouts and taken over by its true natives, the Old Guard, the numbering 70, stood in witness as the last Ruigord priest handed the church keys to two Amsterdam artisans, Helinga and Plomp, and said here, and here it was to be. Soon enough, every undestroyed house in Ruigord was occupied by squatters, many seeking space for art making, many savoring such space plus room for a gallery up front. Now, just a tiny township, a steeple and a streetway or two and outlying fields and not much more. Ruigord quietly made its way, gaining endearment as the last unadministered place in all Holland. One afternoon, a truck cafe unfolded in a field and soon counted Lincoln as a customer. Whenever he could get to Ruigord, he would. With no other purpose, he said, than to see the Scragglies put out their hand-lettered signs and to help out when called, which always came soon, with hauling and welding. Almost every evening he sought it, someone would provide a mattress, a couch, a bedroll, or a closed door. When not in Ruigord, Lincoln remained in Ruigord in Amsterdam. He took an interest in squat politics and hand-washed dishes at De Pepper, a squat restaurant that sold vegan meals for peanuts, or less if you didn't have the shells. He spent frequent evenings at the Bim Hui on Old Shans, listening to improvisationists like Willem Broker and Louis Johnson and Piet Noor, and, once, imported from Amherst in America, Arky Shep, though above all, he adored Han Benink, the hooting stomper drummer who made the world his playpen, and who, for Lincoln, was proof irrefutable that life is worthy, life is joy. And at home, hour upon hour, Lincoln listened to the first jaunty, jangly tracks of the Ordets, the art of the improvisers, and Mingus's prescient, capacious lock em up. For Gilders, he spent two seasons working at a coffee shop called Global Chillage, selling space cakes and pre-rolls of White Widow and Silver Haze, 90% of which went, in summertime, to 20-year-old Spanish and Italian tourists. But Lincoln was never part of the drug world, he said. 
Of course he had taken a few tastes, and escapable in Amsterdam, but no, no thank you. Even so, after about fifteen minutes in the coffee shop, the drift of commerce was so dense that a gentle liftoff became unavoidable. Most of all, Lincoln took an interest in the provost, the loose group of unshackled spirits, now downsized by history, who, with their humored insurrections, foreran the sixties student movements of Paris, Prague, Columbia, Berkeley, everywhere. Growing from the street performances, the original happenings, of Robert Jasper Grootveld, and from the pamphleteering of Rolf van Duyn and Rob Stolk, the provost tweaked and peaked and chided, calling for cars to get out of Amsterdam and Americans to get out of Indochina. They staged mass rally, anti-tobacco cough-alongs, and ran for local office under the slogan, Vote Provo for Better Weather. Dipping their darts in glee, this was a bunch that saw refusal as affirmation. Provo's choice is between desperate resistance or apathetic perishing, wrote Van Duyn. Provo realizes it will lose before long, but it cannot let this last chance slip away. Lonely Europe, arm yourself. The Provo's, in short, had opposition in them, and Lincoln felt it powerfully. He collected some of the movement's original leaflets in magazines, and visited sites in the Spui and the Dam Square where the action had taken place. He even obtained an interview with Grootveld, who lit like a clig when asked about those times, and barely dimmed when he spoke of his current project, recycling refuse into landscape art. These were all situations in which Lincoln's lack of workable Dutch did not hinder, but in other ways it did. The gap could be a social hurdle, he said, and left him without substantial friends, either in number or in solidity. But he did not want to exist other than in English. That was his decision. Then came Alia, and, you know, oh, oh boy. She was Moroccan, you know, and wore a scarf over her hair, which was like black, black, and couldn't resist blading into day. And she was rebellious and had this giggle that, like Lincoln said, was sly. Like she knew. Like she knew because Lincoln couldn't find out. Sly Alia didn't speak English. At least not much more than magazine English, advertising English, top model and smash. But Lincoln was not about to be stopped. They met on a Thursday afternoon at the 10 Kate Market, just off Kinkerstraat. Fittingly, both were buying batteries, and both reached for the same package of AA cells, strewn in a sidewalk basket at the same time. Upon first skin spark, Lincoln heard the giggle. And, he said, it was a livelier, warmer, more richly improvised sound than he had ever heard at the Bin Hui. The giggle was followed by a closed-lipped grin that seemed rehearsed, but Lincoln wrote that off as cultural coding, girl-to-boy protectiveness. He was glad to give her the benefit of the doubt. He would have to, because when Lincoln worked up the nerve to speak, the battery seated with a wave and a smile. The silence settled in. He understood that he would have to call on his Dutch. His rudimentary, unsystematic, learn-on-the-fly, nearly non-existent Dutch. He tried and stumbled several times, but from the first faltering words, more fundamental suspicions were confirmed. He needn't have worried. His nearly non-existent Dutch had got him across. There was something there. He gabbled pointlessly, but easily. She giggled and played along, then gave her telephone number, penned on the torn-off end of a shop receipt, and, parting, Alias' smile was noticeably, certainly, less rehearsed. She worked in a low-level, orderly's position at the OLVG hospital and had just entered night school, two evenings a week. She was still living at home with four siblings who had all been born in the Netherlands, after her parents had emigrated from the region around Rabat, around Treller's now contentious open season of the 60s. She made something in a solar plexus sing. They would meet on wooden benches in the Spau or walk along the cooling paths in Sarfati Park, near where she lived. Her skin was mustard-colored and hard-smooth. Her mouth turned scimitarily down, more so at mid-smile. South of her headscarf, she wore clothes that were simple, unclinging, demure. But it was all a ruse. Elia loved to cage cigarettes from surprised guys, and to read magazines with covers that looked like ads for the airbrushing business. Soon enough, she took Lincoln to night times of music from the Maghreb at clubs on the Monikstrat. Long sets of hard, churning, hand drum propelled pop that some followers called Moroccan roll. And you should see her dance. That girl was a hellion, no doubt about it. But still, Lincoln could not visit her at home. 
and after Lincoln's second phone call, Ailey said it was better for him to make no more. She would do the dialing. At his place, Lincoln waited awful hours for the dead thing to bugle, thoughts too scrambling to read. And like, when they would meet, like, when they were sitting together, it was like sometimes he just wanted to say more to her than he could. Because like, he still really couldn't. His Dutch was hitting its limit, he said, like, his limit. And it really began to get to him. He told me that they developed, like, this game. It was fun, but it also wasn't. They'd be wherever, you know, just walking or sitting, having tea. He told me they liked tea there. And they'd kind of get to the end of what they could talk about. So, like, his girlfriend would pull out this pocket calculator she carried around and just enter some numbers on it, like adding or such. And then she'd hand it to him and, like, he'd just finish the addition. And then his girlfriend would smile and so would he. And that's what they would do, you know. At least it was something they could get together on. At least something was making sense. I mean, this is what he told me. So he decided, finally, to learn Dutch. Lincoln told me he was surprised how much he resisted the decision, even then. But there was no longer any choice. He even came to regret that he hadn't done it before. So he signed up for intensive classes, seven hours a day, five days a week, at a place called the Handelblad School when a letter came from his girl that she couldn't see him anymore. And it was like, that was like, it was her father, he said, reasserting his claim, reining his deviant daughter in. It was a reemergence of a pre-medieval mindset that, based on nothing, grounded in nothing, claimed to know and speak for everything. And this melded to a learned Dutch directness. There could be no appeal. Lincoln said he got a collage maker from Ruigord to translate the letter. After an awkward opening, Reminiscing about some licorice they'd bought at a recent old side street fair, Ailey abruptly said she wouldn't be calling Lincoln again. She also asked him not to call her, and above all, not to show up. Of course, there was no point in writing back. The letters would never get through. And then, only, I'm sorry. For Lincoln, it was an act of subtraction that no computer could calculate. By silent election, he dropped out of his Dutch classes exactly when his friend finished reading the note. Then, for four straight days, he slammed around the city on foot, once walking as far as the Amsterdam's boss, on constant vigil to veer from places associated with the traitor. He listened to clangorous old school free jazz CDs, Gunter Hempel, Albert Ayler, standing with his ears right up to the bookshelf speakers, and he finally bought some of the coffee shop pre-rolls, then rolled a few of his own. The guy moved out of his parents' house. He jammed himself into a top floor former storeroom in a tiny squat on Vesterstadt until he crashed accordingly into All Squat's primordial problem, the bathroom. So he found a legit place and moved in and told his folks five days later when he went back to pick up stuff. Reach out your arms and touch both walls, that kind of thing. Dust clouds under the bed on a block called Angelierstraat. Shower just to hide nozzle right in the bathroom, that kind of thing. Yeah, the drug thing was happening. You know, how couldn't it, right? Soft stuff, legal shit there. He could just go from place to place. Then he stopped. Mm, said he did. Said the spliff just made him feel shittier. He also said he wasn't about to start drinking. Mm, didn't go for that. Whole phase lasted maybe just a few weeks. Really, no more to say about it. Around that time, Lincoln started working for Dremples, a men's clothing store behind a broad window on Hard Lammerdike. It was a fairly high-end place, he said, with Dutch brands like Markhart and Sissy Boy and Italian imports ranging from Tursardi to Big Time to Louis. Lincoln's boss, Sheen haired Carl was decent, he said, and Grace with the gift of preferring to close early when business was slow. The pace of four afternoons a week was just about perfect. The customer's fine training in forcing rosiness. The whole thing was a welcome distraction, and the good skills were there to be learned. He was working at the shop for about a month when his suicide attempt occurred, and to this day he's unsure if his parents know about it. It took place in his apartment, he said, and he believes his instinct would have been to spare them. Regardless, they never spoke about it afterward. The man took a bottle of muscle relaxant pills. He was that low. He said he got them from a drugstore. A usual kind of drugstore. A pharmacy. Not the local version. Because that was like part of the message, according to him. It was like, this isn't something from the margins. Okay, this is... Yeah, Lincoln's suicide attempt. Whew. You know? Like, yeah. He said... I mean, what can you say? Must have been rough. I feel sorry for him. You got to. 
Must have been ambulances and shit. Nights? Well, one night in the hospital, he said. And it stayed with him. He didn't talk about it too much. Didn't get into too much detail. Apparently, it was a genuinely tough time. The effects of the breakup, come on, of the abandonment, was a rough blow. He was just drifting through his life. He said he considered suicide all the time. Said it just like that. And that he didn't have much of a support system because of the whole language thing. Who wouldn't be low? He said he needed some time off then. And took it. Retreated into his apartment. Window shade low. Teapot ready. Miles on the Lenko. Last sale of slacks. Got real conversant with them walls. Said he started reading political magazines. Foreign affairs. Get him out of his head. English language. Bought them from the one shop in town that carried them. Not really nearby. Glad for the reason to get out. Walk a bit. Eventually, of course, the guilders grew slim. And the lesser they grew, the less they cared about his moods. Eventually, he saw a notice in the listings mag called Via Via, and hooked up with a concern that had taken over a few responsibilities from the Dienst Vatebi here in Rio Leering, the city's water and sewage department. Five days a week, he said, mornings and after lunch, Lincoln coasted through the canals of Amsterdam on an 18-meter flatboat, raising objects that had been lost or inadvertently thrown in. By punching buttons on a rectangular panel on the deck, he controlled this huge, round, 220-kilo magnet. In fact, Lincoln said that he was looking for something that would be calm and helpful and purifying, and I think the guy got lucky. The magnet was suspended from a big, heavy, articulated arm, maybe like a giant architect's lamp. And the boat was braced and counterweighted, and Lincoln and this walloon named Jupe would spend all day fishing for metal. Someone whose bicycle had tumbled in, lost keys, lost rings, eyeglasses, you name it. If nature could take it to the bottom, it would be there. People, businesses would call the company and come to meet them at a spot along the canal. Lincoln and the walloon guy would glide up. The people would stand and wait, and... If the item hadn't been found in two plunges, they'd start to gesture, there, try there. And more often than not, they got their goods back. Lincoln's company was paid for its time, not by the value of the salvage. Which wasn't actually an unfortunate thing, because for every object they were looking for, the magnet would dredge up 40 others. Pagers, pocket calcs, outboard motors, necklaces, other jewelry that hadn't been called about. In addition, of course, to the antennas and bike fenders and forks and all the other crud that bearded the magnet. The guys made out like bandits, even after they'd given enough of the detritus to their boss to keep him quiet, as they were supposed to do, with all of it. And Lincoln said he liked visiting this underwater world, with its weird combination of what people found expendable lying right alongside the things they would pay to recuperate. The precious met the perishable, he said. Of course, this trade had its folklore, about fishing out Charles III era to Escudo gold pieces, or a Rolex with an arm attached. But Lincoln wasn't looking for drama, and just gliding over the waterways and seeing what surprises could be pulled from it, and how the non-treasure could be added up to become a nice bit of treasure indeed, did him very well. So he's out there trolling one Wednesday afternoon, looking for some kids' overboarded braces, if you can believe that. And what comes up among the scurf of a plunge is a lady's beaded purse, its metal hasp enough to attract the magnet's attentions. Lincoln ended up with this part of the booty, along with its unknown at the time of the division of the spoils content, a credit slip. The guys had opened the purse, Lincoln said, and turned it upside down and shook it mightily, but the little slip of wet pink paper had clung up in its stitchy fastness. Thing turned out to be an IOU from some used bookstore over by the Sopera, you see. Some little place that Lincoln said he must have walked right past 200 times and never even seen. Seems someone must have brought some books to these guys and couldn't find anything in the whole goddamn place they wanted to exchange him for, you see. So, what the hell, right? The next Friday after work, after Lincoln and Jupe had brought the magnet boat back to its hangar, behind the cruise ship terminal, Lincoln took his bike to the shop, and it turned out to be an English language bookshop, and on top of that, it was their late night. Open till 7, catch them going home purchases. So Lincoln says he walks up the short stoop and goes in, and the place is just tiered all up with 
dusty yellow shelving all the way to the ceiling, all the way to the back, and just more of them in additional rooms up and down short flights of steps to the rear. Bumper to bumper books, right? And just piles upon piles upon the desks up front. It was a classic used bookstore. Cozy, chummy, unpretentious, altogether lovely. Lincoln had come into 18 and a half florins of credit. He was hoping to pick up a few back issues of foreign affairs. Looking back upon past predictions, he said, was the best training for looking down upon those made in the present. He found a stack of magazines dating to the 60s, but he got cold feet. Old news, same old ideas. He decided to look for something by a Robert Coles. He had read something about Coles' notion of entitlement. While looking, Lincoln's coursing index finger touched the spine of a book called The Closing of the American Mind. It had a white cover, vein blue lettering. Who would have thought the old battle axe had any hacks left? Lincoln had never heard of the thing, or of Alan Bloom, but he wanted to be done with his store credit, and so be it. Thus are time hinges made. Because the book spoke to him, not so much its critique of contemporary education, or its exaltation or non-critique of well-worn Bloomsian big soul sentiments. Freedom of mind requires not only the absence of legal constraints, but the presence of alternative thoughts. The external impediments to the free exercise of reason have been removed in democracy. Democracy presented itself as decent mediocrity, and as preferable to the splendid corruption of the older regimes, the gray net of abstraction, used to cover the world in order to simplify and explain it, has become the world in our eyes. Or even the anti multi culty stuff. But, he said, something in Bloom's vision seemed solid, anchored, thought through to the point where it couldn't just be whittled away by opportunists. And while he thought Professor B drew too hard a line in his opposition of values to truth, is there no inherent in values? Aren't values truths suspenders? Hey, that stuff can still rock. So he read through Bloom, then he read about Bloom, then he read Ravelstein, and became interested in the University of Chicago. Just that simple. Got caught up in the mystique. In particular, he said, the committee. Even the title, you know, the Committee on Social Thought. As if this little school division were creating it. What a beacon. The Politburo for Celebration. Irresistible. Lincoln said he loved it even before he knew what it was. <sighs> to be part of that. The next day, Lincoln went to Amsterdam's Open Bear Library to research the committee, and tingled when he read about the sweep of its offerings. Its interdisciplinary program to study just about everything, and the names that had passed through. Arendt, Eliot, Ricoeur, Rogers. Names that were significant, that cast shadows. But shadows of light, shadows of understanding. Light shadows that could make up for his lack of schooling. He read on, he said, and turned a page, and found out he couldn't be part of it. For doctoral students only. And he didn't even have an undergrad degree. Sails out, and when gone. So, he's in there, you know, and mopey. Real disappointed. And something went down. I mean, he said like some librarian steered him to something called Coster's Guide to International Education, and... That's where he had heard about the undergraduate at UC. UC. Same campus as the committee. And UC undergrad, you know. It's all about the core curriculum and, ah, again, synapses sparked. Again, a possibility that was filled with possibility. A program that began with two full years of grounding in the essentials. All of them. Humanities and civilization, natural and mathematical sciences, social sciences, foreign languages. 21 courses taught by full faculty and small seminars. A program refined and perfected since its hesitant beginnings as the new plan in 1931, and now machined to deliver civilization from the time of Pericles on up to yesterday's news. Now, somehow, made rich with significance. It was a bracing expression of Enlightenment ideals, a declaration of support for rigor and reason. Perhaps the culmination of the great tradition's baseline precepts, in a particularly American mode. Leo Strauss's call to guidance by the nobility of the classical texts. Albert Wolfsletter's ennoblement of daily life and his insistence on its deep moral purpose. All was thrilling. He would learn the substrata of politics, the canopy of theory. 
he will learn the full topography of the variated lands that lay beyond the shorelines of his meager knowledge. He would learn French. He would... He was moved, he said, by the school's insistence on maintaining these ideals, on their vital necessity, on UC's recognition of a common core as the basis for all individual development and progress. He was grateful for the college's passionate reminder that this unmovable, prerequisite center was the source from which understanding, even participation, flowed. This would make him a citizen of the world, a citizen of history, a bearer of the great goods. Nothing like this was available at Groningen or Utrecht or, or Halle-Wittenberg. Even the great English universities were not as rigorous. Among other schools in the U.S., he read, only Columbia and St. John's offered comparable programs, had the backbone to resist the contemporary challenges, but none were as strong as UC. Highest number of Nobel laureates of any university. Birthplace of the Chicago School in Economics world-changing advocates of extending Jefferson's grand principles of freedom and individuality to economic life. Highest degree of seriousness for seriousness's sake. Strongest center to build a center that would hold. So he's reading about this, you know, and reading about it, and getting rushy and excited, and then finds out he's too old. The program's for kids who are like 18, and that ain't him. Then he blammed that guidebook closed. He wasn't happy about that at all. But like, you know Lincoln, you know that there's no way he's not going to see if he can smooth things over. No way he isn't going to apply the special sauce. Guy always says, no isn't an ending, it's beginning. By the next evening, he was on the phone with them, with the Office of Special Admissions. It took a few referrals and placements on hold, and lines cut off to find the crack desk, but he got there. You bet he did. The follow-ups were by mail. The outcome was in the bag. Lincoln got the U to agree to admit him to the grand school, the division for older students, and then to let him go through the full undergraduate program, core sequence and all. He would graduate with a BA, the first ever given by Graham. Lincoln said he wasn't altogether sure how they managed this fancy footwork, but he wasn't about to contest it. Said they just seemed to like him. Later on, when he had a preferred seat in the dining hall, he knew to avoid the Thousand Island dressing, he heard that applications to UC undergrad had been nosediving, specifically because emerging high school students didn't want core curriculum anymore, found it a distraction. And this even after the school had reduced the number of required core classes from 21 to 18, which happened two years ago. Good, Lincoln said, he thought. More attention available for him. And the school certainly was supportive even offered him a package of financial aid, and helped him get a student visa, keep him legal. Certainly, he would be years older than his fellow students, a difference that the U people said would vanish in his classmates' eyes in about five minutes. Well, Lincoln said, maybe six. Because these first contacts were happening in May, Lincoln had to apply for admission starting next September, 16 months later. In his room, with a calendar, he had counted that number twice, his fingers slowing as he closed in on the month, impossibly distant. You know, Lincoln and his optimism slash flexibility nexus, he just worked the delay to his advantage, took the time to get a job, in fact, several. He said he usually had two gigs, sometimes three, while he was waiting to board for Chicago. Anything he could snag. In restaurants and hotels, the usual hustling handyman circuit. And it paid off. He ended up working for over two years, he said, because he decided to delay coming to Chicago by an additional year so he could do it financially on his own, at least as much as possible. Things were good at home, and by the end of that second year, his bank book was looking pretty good, too. Well-fed and healthy. Healthy enough that he didn't have to lean too hard on his parents for money assistance. Hey, the guy's got a conscience. Lands on his feet. Oh, Lincoln did counterbalance some of the demands of that time with intervals taken for himself. Late at night, or on the occasional Sunday afternoon, he prepared himself for his new world adventure. This wasn't required by the university, but Lincoln said he saw some of virtue in trying to bridge the chasm between himself and his future fellow students, some of whom, he knew, would be arriving from Andover or Exeter or St. George's, well-steeped and better versed. He embarked on some preparatory reading, dipping into overviews and survey literature, including Greer and Russell and even some time with the Durants. 
A chance association in one of these surveys led him to deeper investigations into positivism, a philosophy he found condign to his developing temperament. Also had a few, shall we say, flings during this period, he said. First non-big deal tumbles. Irrigated a few tulips. And throughout this time, he said, when he was preparing to come to UC and commence his sentimental education, one thought kept thronging into his mind. Would he someday make member of the committee? Man, you know, Lincoln. You know? Guy's the greatest. Guy listens to you. Like, one time, this is maybe a month ago, this guy with two earrings in his ear comes over and starts gargling that the wife don't screw him no more. Just like that. Opened up just like that. To Lincoln, who barely knew him. But you know how it goes. Girl don't put out. Guy puts out the verbiage plenty. Wife was there, but in the john. This was at a reception. And Lincoln tells him, tell you what. So Lincoln takes the guy over and starts talking with this real looker. Six foot if she's a day, and gorgeous. Bigums like this. And Lincoln's putting his hand on the guy's shoulder while they're talking, just like laughing and gabbling. And the guy eventually joins in and starts talking to the looker too. And the girl, of course, maybe to be nice to Lincoln, she also starts talking to the guy. By then, the wife is back in the reception room and sees all this. And she comes over and they all jaw for another second. And then, you know, the thing has run its course and the bodies say goodbye. Lincoln moves on and chat times through. Well, starting that night, and for as far as the eye can see, the wife is dialed in, screwing like she's auditioning for the Playboy channel. And the guy tells me all this, and guess what else he tells me? That his wife had her thermonuclear change not because she was jealous, because she saw the looker talking to him, but because she saw him talking to Lincoln. She's only asking him about him, okay? So I tell all this to Lincoln, and you know, he just smiles. Fucker do it all the time. That fucker knew it. How does the boy do it? It isn't a riddle. Once over our magnax at the Drake, in a back booth at the Coq d'Or, he responded to my perhaps repeated prodding. He had come to his abilities via studying a bit of philosophy, he said. The school of thought called positivism that he had discovered when in Holland. Yeah, he said this positivism, it sounded like some American thing, like some kind of American religion, like Brightsideism or nice deism, as if it were Locke's creed when he ghost wrote the Constitution. What a guy. Good natured blunder. Of course, positivism was just a 19th century revival of Enlightenment hopes for determining objective truth, spiked with the scientific predilections and optimism of the day. It's easy to see how this might snag someone who'd imprinted on Alan Bloom. Crudely, positivism was a fetish for measurement. Not so crudely, it was the belief that we can only know what we perceive with our senses, and that this can be measured with sufficient accuracy as to deliver certain knowledge of absolute reality. Ergo, this is the only window we should be looking through. So poof to speculation, poof to induction, poof to metaphysics, triple poof to theology. That what's there is that what's there. The movement was deeply empiricist and deterministic and led to such losers as the behaviorists, who believed, like B.S. Skinner, that there's nothing more to mental life than shocks and sweets. And of course, with a program like that, which left no room for trivia such as atoms, genes, the circle, measurement fallibility, interpretive bias, quantum and determinancy, hell, all of intangible dynamics, mind, desire, justice, morality, and a couple of others, Positivism had to go. Forefather Comte never realized his perfect feminized polity, but the movement did kick up a few clouds, and Lincoln continues to say he finds it oddly meaningful. I mean, he said he was stoked just by the word positivism. He said it was having a real effect on him, and he knew. He said he knew it would help him. Yeah, though, you know, I once heard that, like, this positivism thing, if you kinda you know, how like it could make you all like passive, all like accepting of everything. It's like Lincoln, he said, so be it. That's what people say when they can't hope for anything more than what's in front of their eyes. And Lincoln said, he liked the new feelings of ambition that were stirring inside him. Just the thought, he said, 
of coming to the States seemed to raise his temperature. Just the thought of leaving Amsterdam contributed a few more degrees of lift. Amsterdam, that small, small city, still undeniably in the grips of the Calvino conformist pressures, would be a load to leave behind. He said those duchies took self-effacement to the point of self-obliteration, that their tribal instinct towards non-ostentation became a form of ostentation in its own right, and the fact that they're so damn judgmental. He was never comfortable with that, he said. Absolutely, the Dutch are tolerant, but that doesn't mean they don't judge. Which they do, he said, all the time. So, Lincoln used local tradition. He judged that intolerable. Hey, Lincoln Selwyn is nothing if not practical, and he came over because he thought his possibilities in the Netherlands were approximately zilcho. Things keep you down in that country, he said. He felt that in Holland, there was a cheese ceiling over his head. That's what he called it. And hey, you know, there's one place on earth that you don't want to be, and that's under a ceiling of cheese. So he came over. He landed. Top of September, OO. KLM Direct, Schiphol to O'Hare, one-way ticket. Blinking dry under the seven hours of jet lag, waiting for his two knapsacks at the spin-around carousel, he greeted all the skip-doodle of the airport with the grand gesture of a sneezing fit, plus gurgly coughing. Huge outflushes of gases and sputa, tears leaping from every back whip. Good four minutes, he said. First time in the U.S., he's saluting it with mucus. Laughed about it on the Blue Line Inn. Transferred to the Metro down to 55th Street in Hyde Park. You'd set him up with an apartment on Woodlawn. Two rooms, a bed, a desk, a closet, 10,000 traces of poster tape. He was all of five minutes from the tap, mm, sorry, Jimmy's. So he had a place to take a sip. Just the sight of the campus, he said, set his system a tip. He walked to the main quadrangle, by the Bartlett Hall and the Reynolds Club, and the great masses of Gothic revival, the brawny, unbroken destiny of golden Indiana limestone heaped up in towers and crenellations, the stately march of ogival arches, old-looking and unworn, screamed something American to him. All this lifted history, paid for unflinchingly by the oil titan, made him feel something about show and about belief, about quantities hungry to become qualities. He wandered on, the neat green lawns, the ranges of Norway maples, lindens and swamp oaks, the discordant modern buildings thrust in with no need for explanation, the white paved walkways, the bulky students throwing an American football. That point looked like it could hurt. It all felt like a confirmation, but a confirmation somehow of something he had never really seen or considered before. And as he walked around this first time, riddled with jet lag, the thought came chiming up behind his forehead, then gorging in his throat, that someday, and not too far along, he, Lincoln, would, would certainly be sitting down with the other members of the committee. This concludes part one of The Easy Chain by Evan Dara. Again, you can go to aurora148.com to learn more about the book and the author and his other works. Um, this book isn't really split into parts, but I'm having to do that because otherwise it's a 500-page novel. I hope you enjoy and that you stay tuned for the next part in which we cover his time in university. Thank you.